All right, so today we'll start talking about natural language processing. Um, I'll get into more of the details in a little bit, but natural language processing is one of the, um, it's basically an, a way of getting your text from words, you know, and we know that, you know, our machine learning algorithms cannot interpret strings. It's getting our data from words to some numerical representation. So today we'll be talking about some ways of doing that. And we'll actually continue this on Monday. And Monday, I'll actually be going through some of the stuff that is in the appendix, because I do think it is important for anyone who's getting into NLP to at least be aware of the material that's in the appendix. So um, I'll talk about the appendix stuff. Well, most of the appendix stuff on Monday. So just look out for that. So agenda today, we'll talk about some an overview of NLP, talk about the, the whole realm of like text analytics and what that's all about. Um, we'll also talk about some of the pre-processing steps that you have to take before diving into any of like the analysis. We'll talk about feature engineering. At the very end, we'll do a very, very quick text classification example. Um, you'll see that we're, I believe at the very bottom, we're going to be using the same one of the models that we used in mod three. So it should look familiar, just this time we get to use text data. We get to classify text data. And it will be detecting satire uh, versus not satire. So to get into it, text analytics and NLP. So NLP basically allows computers to interact with text data in a structured and sensible way. Let me zoom in a little so it's bigger. So we'll discuss steps and approaches to common text data analytical procedures. In other words, with NLP, computers are taught to understand human language, um, its meaning and sentiments. Um, we'll actually get to different ways and different degrees to which we can have a machine learn language. Um, so some applications of NLP are chatbots, classifying documents, that's the one that we're gonna talk about, um, as well as speech recognition and audio processing. So the idea of speech recognition, you start with some audio file, it gets translated into, or it gets transcribed into words, and then you can basically do all of these same processes as well. So in this section, we'll talk about the pre-processing steps, feature engineering, and other steps you need to take in order to format text data for machine learning tasks. So you'll see that our end product here um, will be to get our text data into a data frame with some numerical representation of the text. So an overview of the NLP process, um, we start with our raw text data. So this image over here is just our raw text data. Um, for pretty much anything that you have to do, we're gonna go through this step called tokenization. We'll talk about tokenization just under this. Um, Pre-processing, and feature engineering. And all of these basically result in numerical representation of words, which you can then use to build your models and evaluate your models. Um, so to start, there are all of these things that we're gonna import. Some of the main ones that are new, you see that we have NLTK. NLTK is one of the main libraries for natural language processing. It stands for Natural Language Toolkit. Um, and we'll see some of the things that we'll use there. Um, within NLTK, we have these and we'll see them as they come about. Um, within NLTK, there are also dictionaries. You can sort of think of these as dictionaries. So for example, uh, we'll get into more of these later. NLTK has stop words where you can immediately just Im import a list of stop words for your usage. Um, and this is gonna be very, very helpful later and we'll see why. The other thing that I'm gonna point to is Scikit-learn also has some text methods. Um, so these are things that we'll get to later as well. So this is with, within Scikit-learn, feature extraction.txt. Um, within here, everything else we should see, uh, we should have seen before. We have a bunch of, this is not in order, but a bunch of things from Scikit-learn like models, uh, metrics, we have our matplotlib, seaborn, all of this should be familiar. So let's talk about tokenization first. That's one of the main, most foundational level keywords when it comes to NLP. So tokenization is just the process of splitting documents into units of observations. So we usually represent the tokens as n-grams, where n is the number of consecutive words occurring in a document. So most of what we'll be working with today is unigrams. 
single word tokens. So for example, if we have the sentence, David, work here, David works here, if I want to represent it as unigrams, it would just be a list of three separate words, David works here. Um, so we have David works here, these three are unigrams. But alternatively, the next thing we can do is, you see here we have n-grams. The next step above this is bigrams. So basically like two word occurrences. So if I wanted to take David works here and turn it into bigrams, the two bigrams would be David works and works here. Um, so that's what an n-gram is. Mostly today we'll be working with unigrams, but as extensions to your, to your feature extraction, which we'll talk about later, you can also use bigrams or even trigrams in like, imagine if you have like a long paragraph of text and what's important to you is like three word occurrences, that's up to you. But we'll see more application of this as we go on. So as an example, this is just a movie review. So here you can see from the beginning of the movie, blah, 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 gives a feeling the director is. So this is just a movie review that we will play with. Um, something that is going to be important to do some NLP pre-processing is regex. So regex is short for regular expressions, regular expressions. And anything regex, it sort of looks like a convoluted string, but this regex allows us to clean the text. So basically what this means, and there is an entire lesson on like getting used to regex. I'm also going to send out regex um, other regex resources after this, because regex takes a little bit of getting used to. But what this means is we're going to accept any token that has A to Z, small letter A to Z, big letter, capital letter A to Z, and also any numbers. And this just means that these are all the characters that we're accepting. And this plus sign just means how, the length of it doesn't matter. Um, if, for example, imagine if this was a tweet and you have like at someone, the at someone that wouldn't be kept. But let's just take a look at what this does. This is a regex token tokenizer. Um, and by using this tokenizer, we can clean up this text and tokenize this text. Uh, and at the same time, we're just going to clean out anything that has characters that we don't want. So if I run this real quick. Let's take a look at our tokenized review. Tokenized review. You can see now we end up with a list of words. Um, this text is by itself pretty clean, but you can sort of see here that there is no punctuation either. Um, so having no punctuation is also something that we've cleaned as a result of this tokenizer. Uh, so, yes, question? Yes. Is, is everything that is that is removed is it stored somewhere? It is not stored anywhere. No. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. So if it, it so is it even possible to? It's like so with this text, I I could just look at it and okay, this was removed or or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're not. Are you? Would you? Is there a way for you to see like where in the text the these these symbols were removed? Um. I guess you could probably reverse this procedure and like compare the original review to the tokenized review. Uh, but no, not- There's no like, not, met okay, got it. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Not that I'm aware of at least. Um, I will say you're removing- usually what, you what you've already placed is. it. Yeah. Right, gotcha. No, that's fine. I mean, like if you're looking at a huge text and may, I'm thinking, okay, where did these symbols get removed? Right, and that's a good point. Yeah, you know, but no, that's fine. Yeah, not that I'm aware of, but I'm. I wouldn't be surprised if someone out there has tried to work on this problem. Um, and, and what would it do mm -hmm. with like um, apostrophes, like can't and or dishes mm -hmm. or whatever? Yeah, work? let's see if there are any. I don't think there are any examples in here, but I believe that you. I want to say that you do keep. Um, or you, are you split it are up you based on do, apostrophes. Are you able to say like, okay, this, like, can you can you do the regex uh, mm -hmm. tokenizer, but then uh, have a set of unigrams that it doesn't touch? Yeah, we'll actually get to that in a little bit. Okay, gotcha. Um, but in terms of like contractions, like anything with an apostrophe, honestly, I forget what, let's see. Uh, let's just edit this review. 
so that it has, um, I'm thinking, let me, okay, let me see if I can do, you know what, let me just make a new text and do it. So test equals to, I'm testing this out and let's try this. Cool, yeah, so it does split it up where the um, apostrophe is, um, which might be okay for now, might not be, but we'll take a look. Um, their base, I will say the regex tokenizer is not the only method of tokenizing text. There are others, which I think I'll, I think I have another one later on, um, but yeah. Any other questions before we move on? Just one quick question is, yeah. Is is tokenization used in any other uh, you know area of uh, like machine learning or data science or is this is it just related to, te uh, to text? To Not my to knowledge, to, to my knowledge, it's just the process of taking you know a long string of like a big paragraph and separating out into its individual words. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, not just individual words, but also like two. What's the word two word tokens sure. or three word tokens? For yeah. sure. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. All good. All right. So, yeah, regex tokenizer splits the string using a regular expression, which matches either the tokens or separators between tokens. So, let's just take a look at the length of our review 145. And then, what's really neat, we have frequency distribution. Um, this is something that comes from NLTK, if you remember here. Where is it? Yeah. And LTK has frequency distribution. It basically does a word count for us, which is very, very neat. So you can see here, we have our frequency distribution. This doesn't print out, but we can plot it out. And we can plot out. And now let's take a look at some of these words. Um, at first glance, let me zoom in a little bit more. At first glance, you see the, to, he, of, movie, I, A, so and so forth. So at first glance, are these words very informative? And can we really extract useful information based on this frequency distribution of the most common words? Um, looking at more of these words, there's like that, what, say, I don't know, make, and, this, knows. So it seems to be a lot of, you know, not meaningless, but words that don't really add much in terms of helping you understand what this review is talking about. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is stop words removal. So as I mentioned, um, NLTK has these stop words that you can just import. So let's take a look at the stop words. Um, they also have it for different languages, which is really interesting. I personally haven't played with any other languages, but if you do know lang another language could be interesting to see what you've got there. But let's just take a look at the set of stop words that is included in NLTK. So you can see that there is, I don't know, some main ones, himself, our, uh, his, any, be, into, the, oh, this is them, uh, but I'm not, I'm pretty sure the is in here somewhere, but basically you have a list of stop words that already exists. So you can kind of filter out your text to just get rid of these meaningless words. And the reason why we do this, we'll sort of see later, but I think I've kind of alluded to uh, with NLP, one way of dealing with NLP is each individual word will be a column in your data frame, uh, which you can imagine if you're not cleaning up meaningless words, you just have a bunch of meaningless columns. Um, so it's kind of like a method of feature selection as well. But really quickly, now that we have these stop words as a set very um, convenient for us, we can filter it. So you can see here, I'm just going, I'm just looping through all my words in my tokenized review and seeing if something is not in stop words, append it. And also what I'm doing here is I'm also appending it in a lower case, because in my case, I don't care if the letter starts with a capital letter or not. It shouldn't matter in this case. So here you can see our filter sentence is a lot shorter. Uh, more specifically, it's gone down from 145 words to 61 words. Um, the words are still in the order that they turned up in, uh, but you can see that these words are a little bit more helpful. If we plot the frequency distribution of the filtered review, 
you can see that, I mean, the counts are not as high anymore. The word that comes up the most is movie at five. But I think that these words are a little bit more meaningful or interesting, right? So movie director trying, say, beginning, feeling, portray something, dictating, style. It is a lot more informative than our last set of words. Again, these words without context and without like the right order doesn't really make sense, but you can get more information out of this, you could argue. So we have basically removed semantically meaningless words. Any questions at this point? So Ayush, uh, I was just uh, trying to understand. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. so there was a book uh, that you were doing one of those, uh, one of the project kind of, not, not project, maybe one of the uh, place where we had uh, right, the top 50 books, which we okay. have to figure out, right? Oh, yeah, like the very first, I think the very first lab was like a word count for like Macbeth, and you had to count the number of yeah, words, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so I remember uh, Macbeth. similar to that, uh, how those things, like, like let's say if we have to find uh, the best words for, right, the top words used in Twitter today, yeah. right? Or let's say maybe right because the, all those uh, newspapers which they release. So from there, if we have to pull data mm -hmm. and uh, right work it with like the Macbeth project and then combine the NLP, yeah. right? Uh, will this work as a, right uh, right where we have to predict things that okay this is if such words are used, some, some words like, uh, uh, let's say, a word president is used, mm -hmm. right? Whichever president, right? Everything yeah. comes down to, let's say, immediate search comes to, let's say the presidential election, which just came up. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is, tomorrow, if somebody is going to search for the word president in Google or Twitter, he is more likely to land in a page on a page which is going to be right for let's say specific election of a country kind of so would we be able to do that with these um well i will say that you're talking about like search engine optimization right so when you search for president mm -hmm. you want the most relevant things to come up Correct. technically yeah there have been projects done where actually one of the ones that I will share with you when we get to capstones is someone actually did a project where if you just sort of describe something that happened in the book, it'll tell you which book it came from. So kind of a similar way, it's like relevance, um, which I mean, it is NLP um, because you would have to like, you know, train it to remember like meaning and stuff like that, that will make more sense actually on Monday. We'll talk about something similar on Monday. How do we get meaning from text and relevance from text? Um, but yeah, those, the cleaning steps that you have to take for the starting of the starting point of those projects, you would have to do this as well. Yeah, and what about uh, numbering each, uh, like we did for categorical data, mm -hmm. where we had to put numbers for each words or each column numbers oh like so your yeah to feed it into a, a model it has to all be numbers right yeah you're talking about yeah, yeah. We're, we're gonna go through those steps in a little bit okay yeah anything else at this point all right so now we've removed semantically meaningless words what we've done so far we've tokenized and then we've removed stop words um so the next thing we want to talk about is lexicon normalization. So basically, aside from stop words, a different type of noise can arise in NLP. So consider the example, uh, the words collect, collection, collected, and collecting. They're all similar. They kind of, you know, allude to having the same meaning. So having each of these words as a separate column, one, takes up space in your, it like increases the dimensionality of your data, but also, is it important to have all of these variations? Sometimes yes, most of the time, no. So we're gonna talk about two methods, stemming and lemmatization. 
these two methods basically reduce all variations of the same word to the root version of all its derivations. Before I get into this, I will just tell you now that there is stemming and there's lemmatization. Um, it is pretty much agreed on that lemmatization is better than stemming, but it's just something that's good to be aware of. So I'll talk about stemming first, and then we'll go into lemmatization, and you'll see why it's preferred. So stemming. Stemming basically allows us to remove different variations of the same word. Basically, all of these words, uh, collect, collection, collecting, will all be reduced to collect. So what stemming does, stemming is the process of reducing inflection in words to their root forms. So it maps a group of words to the same stem, even if the stem itself is not a valid word in the language. So that's an important part to remember what we're doing here. Um, the stem itself might not be an actual English word. And we'll actually see this with the picture example I have below here. So stems are created by removing the suffixes or prefixes used with a word. So you can see here, all of these words change, changing, changes, changed, changer, its stem is change with no E. It recognizes that all of these can be condensed to the same thing, but because, I mean, this comes more to like root words, um, but it sees this, this C-H-A-N-G is the stem of all of these words. Um, so this again, not the valid English word, but it is the stem of all of these words. Oh, one quick question. So let's say if, there, if I put a word called e change, mm -hmm. right? So there is e as prefix and change, mm -hmm. which continues. Even yeah. then, it will pick up only c h a n g. Honestly, it's hard to say because a lot of this is done. Like there is an there is a dictionary that exists that does this mapping. If there is a word that doesn't exist in the English dictionary, I believe they won't make any changes to it. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, but but yeah, basically, if e change was an English word, then that has this as a stem. It would also it would map it back to that as well. Mm -hmm. um, kind of relate to that. I don't know. I may have just missed it because I left. Um, how small will it go? Or um, phrase, like like the word a is a word in the English dictionary, or yeah. is because we did the stop thing, it won't count that. Mm -hmm. Well, so imagine we didn't remove stop words. If we have words like a in like the, those will likely be the stem. So if a word doesn't have a stem, it'll just leave it as is as well. Um, it's not necessary that a word has to get shorter. Uh, I mean, with stemming, it usually does. It can remain the same length if it cannot find like a shorter form or a more generalized form of the word. I guess I'm just thinking the letter a is going to be in most words, I imagine. Oh, oh, I see, I see. Like, basically, will they cut this down to A? Yeah. Um, right, okay, so in this, like, stemming dictionary, they sort of know what words map to what. So it is, I believe it is, I, I, I want to say it is manually coded somewhere, um, but they would not change the meaning of the word, if that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's just do a really quick example. Again, I want to reiterate that most people don't use stemming anymore. It's just good to know that it exists. So here, the specific stemmer that we'll use is just called the Porter stemmer. That's just what it's named. Um, and so we're going to instantiate it, and then we're going to stem each word. So we're going to do for word in the review. We're going to just append the stem diversion. Let's take a look at what this looks like. Uh, let's not see the list. Let's just see the actual review. So print stemmed review. All right, so this is what the, the stemmed review looks like. You can see that movie, apparently they took out the E as well. Um, I don't even know what TRI is. Something got cut down to some, uh, but you can see that there are- I have yeah. a lot of things, trident, tri mm -hmm. triceps. Yeah, exactly. So that is one downside to stemming. A lot of these words are not actually English words, and it's hard for us to look at this and be like, all right, what was this original word in the first place? Uh, but just to quickly see, if we take a look at the plot, this is what the plot looks like. Honestly, not very important right now. Um, so next, as a level up to stemming, we have lemmatization. 
So the only difference between lemmatization and stemming really is that lemmatization returns real words. And you can see just based on this, having it return real words is a huge benefit. Um, so here you can see, yeah, instead of returning movie, like the Porter Stemmer would, movie, the full word will be returned by the lemmatizer. So yeah, the, infle the inflected words will be reduced properly, ensuring that the root word belongs to the language and the root word is called the lemma. Again, this is more like linguistics, uh, but yeah. A lemma is the canonical form, dictionary form, or citation form of a set of words. So all of these words will be the full word change instead. Uh, quick really, question, can you make yes. your own lemmatizer? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know. Honestly, I've never had to use my own lemmatizer. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I. I would I just be surprised if because, you can't, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just asked because I mean, like if you, like for example, Twitter, like the, like there are a lot of words that people might use that have some kind of sentiment to them that aren't actually in accepted by Google. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, actually, a lot of what we'll talk about tomorrow helps us get around those, uh, get around those issues of like, one, like words that are not traditional, maybe like slang words that actually will be taken care of tomorrow. Oh, not tomorrow, on Monday, sorry. Yeah. Uh, one, one quick question. So, mm -hmm. uh, so now I saw when the other, uh, the previous one, uh, mm -hmm. like the movie word was repeated. So does it not pick up only unique words? Oh, so here we're actually taking the, the original filtered review. So we're actually doing it to this. So we're doing it to this. And this is not like unique words. This is literally the entire review with no stop words. Um, so then, yeah, we're doing lemmatization on this. So this with the stemmer, you can see that movie, yeah, it appeared multiple times because it's doing this in order for each word. Mm -hmm. Because we still want to maintain like the word counts in a way, yeah. We don't want to condense it, and we'll talk about why that is later. Um, so yeah, uh, really quickly going back to lemmatizing again. Oh, one thing to mention: lemmatizers and stemmers they work on individual words. So you'll have to get your data to become tokens so that you can apply the stemmer or the lemmatizer onto the specific word. So. Same, we're instantiating the lemmatizer here. And just as like a quick example, we're just gonna lemmatize a bunch of random words. So here you can see um, we have movies becomes movie, collecting, stays at collecting, collection and collections, both go down to collection. So you can see that, um, yeah, all of these resulting words are, um, are actual English words. So with a comparison to stemming, with movie, uh, again, we lost the E. And with collect, collecting actually gets reduced one more time to collect. Um, I guess in the back end, this lemmatizer sees that there is a difference between the word collecting and to collect. I don't know why exactly, but yeah, just to observe some differences. Um, what we can do here, we're just going to lemmatize our original review. So here you can see, oh, this is not important right now, but we can see our actual review has all of these words. So beginning, movie, give, feeling, director, try and portray something, mean, say. It does sound like broken English, but at least you can derive some meaning out of these words rather than having to guess. Um, I think the try word might have been trying which is weird. So there are some drawbacks to these, um, but yeah. So that is another level of pre-processing for text. So uh, what happens when uh, there is error in the data itself? Like uh, let's say in, when somebody types in the data, let's say instead of movie as a single word, yeah. They have split. I mean, there is an accidental space in between mm -hmm. move and uh, MOV and space, then IE. So, will that be considered as two separate words? That will be considered as two separate words, yes. 
none of these pre-processing pre-processing techniques, even the ones we talk about tomorrow, unfortunately do not take into account typos. Uh, so it's very important that, I mean, maybe typos will be part of your model. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, none of these will take into account typos because it's very hard to, I guess no one has created a library for anything like that to like detect one typos and to like what the typos are meant to be. So like when the Google does yeah, grammar, when, uh, you type in something and then it posted, you oh, mean this? Yeah, right. autocorrect, yeah, autocorrect. I honestly don't know. Autocorrect, the school kind of knows sometimes that you, what you meant to type. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, for sure. Uh, autocorrect has, um, so autocorrect, I'm not sure what goes behind autocorrect. Honestly, I'm guessing it's probably some neural network. Text prediction, we'll actually talk about when we get to neural networks, like predictive text, like continuing like the rest of your sentence, like on, I know some of the phone keyboards do that. Um, we'll talk a little bit, very briefly high level about how that works, uh, I think in our very last study group. Um, but yeah, yeah, in terms of typos, at least in Python used for NLP, not that I'm aware of. Um, but yeah, anything else at this point? All right, so let's get into feature engineering. So this is the step where we're actually going to turn these words into numerical representations of our observations. So machine learning algorithms that we've encountered so far represent features as variables that take on different values for each observation. So for example, if we have a row being an individual, uh, the, um, the different variables that describe the individual are education levels, income, so on and so forth. So this is done differently in NLP. In order to pass text data to machine learning algorithms, we need to represent each text observation numerically. And one such method is bag of words. So today, there are two main methods we're gonna talk about. Both are bag of words methods. So bag of words model or methods for short, BOW for short, is a way of extracting features from text for use in modeling. Um, a bag of words is a representation of text that describes the occurrence of words within a document. It involves two things. First, a vocabulary of known words, and then a measure of the presence of known words. So a really quick one, and we'll actually get into that, is you think about word counts. That is the information that you could throw into a model because those are numerical representation, the measure of the presence of the known words. So it is called a bag of words because information about order or structure of the words in the document is discarded. We're not considering order or structure of words. And you'll see later in our resulting data frames that is not considered. The model is only concerned with whether known words occur in the document, but not where in the document. Um, again, for like this added context that we'll talk about on Monday. The intuition behind doc bag of words is that a document is similar to another as long as they have similar contents. So bag of words data can be represented as a document term matrix in which each column is a unique word and each row is a document. So as a really, really simple example, we have these four documents. I love dogs, I love cats, I love all animals, I hate dogs. We can represent this numerically and this will literally be what we throw into a data, into a machine learning model if we have another like label, for example. Uh, we can represent this as a table of word counts. So you can see the word I, you get a one in each row under the I column. Love, same for the first three is all one. Then the first one has dogs, second one has cats, third one has all. Um, and then animals is only the third one. The rest should be populated with zeros because as you know, machine learning models don't like null values. So as a really, really quick example, um, we'll see that, and we did already um, import this before, but just so it's here, we can use the count vectorizer. So the count vectorizer will take this list of documents. So it's just a list of strings and turn it into this. And it's pretty neat. So first what I'm doing is I am instantiating it. And if I have any stop words, you can actually add lists of stop words. Um, and we'll see an example later on because these are pretty short sentences to begin with. Then you fit transform. You can fit transform these documents. So really quick, let's take a look. 
So automatically, this is done for us. Um, it looks like I was automatically taken away. I am not sure why, but not important anyways. Um, you can see that this is basically that um, our first four documents have been transformed into this numerical representation. Um, so let's really quickly do a very, very simple classification. So the first three rows love animals. The last person hates animals. So let's just create like an array of Y, zero for animal lovers, one for animal haters. This is a very, very quick example. Um, with this, you can instantiate a naive Bayes model as an example, fit your X and Y, and let's just take a look at the predictions. So this is fit, and you can see these are predictions. Again, super simple example, just to show that this data, this represents words, this already can be thrown into a model. Um, so yeah, any questions of, about this? So uh, what if like uh, on the stop part, and I, if I have to just specify that, okay, stop word I itself. Instead yeah. Of it's yes. the color. What would happen? So just an example, I'm just going to throw in, let's just say love, because love seems to be the most common. If I throw in the stop word love here, you can see that that is just not there. So usually what people do is people actually feed in the stop words from, where is that? The stop words from earlier, which is over here. So people usually just give this entire list or set of stop words into that um, count vectorizer. So this can be like uh, with the comma, we can have multiple stop words, right? That's right. Yep. You can even add to this list as well. And that's something that's pretty common. Okay. Yeah. So basically we've seen how we've transformed these documents and each of these is a document. We've transformed these documents into numerical representations of themselves that can be fed into some model. Um, so this count vectorizing, so count vectorizing, this is one feature engineering method for NLP. So with just this, and you can do this with like a bunch of tweets, for example, actually the, um, the project for this topic is, uh, is on classifying the sentiment of tweets, whether it's positive or negative. Um, all those tweets will come with labels of whether they are positive or negative, And all you have to do is just build a model that can classify those. Um, so yeah, just for you all who are thinking about the project. Um, so the you other thing I want to, oh, mm -hmm. question. will that be like the, the credit card data where like who will default and who will not kind of like, yeah, yeah. It's pretty much predict. I think it's a three class classification problem between like positive sentiment, negative sentiment, or neutral. And the tweets are all talking about like Apple products or something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. all right. So. That is just one method to pre-process your text. As an alternative, remember this is an alternative method, uh, there's another method called TFIDF. TFIDF stands for term, stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. So essentially, TFIDF normalizes the raw count of the document term matrix and represents how important a word is in the given document. So basically, you'll see that when we do the TFIDF, whereas word counts are integers of like how many times a word has come up, um, TFIDF you usually end up with a bunch of small decimals, like small floats. And basically it is gonna be different across each row. Um, I'll have an example later, but just to quickly show what this looks like, this is just four reviews. We're gonna do a tokenization step in the count vectorizer include stop words real quick. And then we're going to see our, oops, we're going to see our text counts here. So this is just the reviews, um, these example reviews that we had here. Now, this is the count vectorized version. We're going to take a look at the TFIDF vectorized version. Oops, there we go. So in the TFIDF vectorized version, 
you see that our numbers are all floats. Um, something that I wanted to point out as an example, um, let's see if there are any that have the same words. All right, so you see how, let's see if we can get working here. So how working here has two ones. So that means they'll be the same, but working here, you have two different values. This is the same text. Let me actually just move this so that they're next to each other. All right. So here in working, working in document three has a higher number than working in document four, whereas here you have the same number. Why this number is higher is basically saying that working, the word working is more unique to document three than document four. And that's the whole idea of TFIDFs. So here we're basically using the TFIDF vectorizer, which is another way to represent your words as numbers, where each word is reweighted based on how unique a word is to a specific document. So would you say, is this a, well, I'm not sure. I mean, it depends on the situation, but generally, if you have multiple documents, you're going, you're going to want to use the T, T, TF IDF or is that the right? Is it? Yeah, TF IDF. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. Honestly, and actually, when we get into like the projects, I will talk about this as well. Um, most of the time, you actually will try both and see which one yields mm. better results. So you'll oh. actually have like a set of different pre processed da data frames and mm maybe like a couple models and you'll just see which pre-processed data is better for your modeling. Cause I guess, you know, sentiment could be, it doesn't, it doesn't, sentiment's not only related to uniqueness. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's uniqueness? Suppose like you had the word rowboat up here up 50 times in one review and appeared one time in the other review. So in the review that it has 50 times, it's not unique. So it would have a low score, TFIDF score. Mm, that's a good question. So based on the formula of TFIDF here, uh, which it has the, um, there's actually, this is not the full formula, but anyways, you this multiply, is- You multiply yeah. TF times IDF, right? Mm -hmm, that's right. But you see, it goes in like the number of documents. So if the um, the one with 50 occurrences of the word rowboat will actually have a much higher value. Because let's say you have 100 documents and, TF, and the word rowboat only appears 50 times in one and one time in another, um, the TFIDF number will be high for both of those, but even higher for the one that appears 50 times. OK. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so it does um, also kind of measures the importance of the word in the document, in the yeah. prominence of it, not just the uniqueness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, yeah, it's a com combination. I guess the term frequency captures the prominence and the inverse document frequency sort of captures the uniqueness. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Okay. Well, cool. but yeah, again, to remember that TFIDF and count vectorizers are alternatives of each other. Um, so yeah, um, basically these are, um, these are functions that I'm going to use later. This function, what it's going to do is I'm going to take in documents, feed it into a count vectorizer and give me the data frame. Cause as you can see here to get to these steps, I did have to do all of these steps because the output of a transformed the output after you put it into a vectorizer is just in a, it's actually a sparse array. Um, and just to remind you all what sparse arrays are, I think I had an example here. You can see that this was right after I fed it into a vectorizer. And let's take a look at sparse counts, uh, text count, sorry. It is a sparse matrix. Now, I believe I'd mentioned it like maybe two phase, two mods ago, but a sparse matrix is basically a more efficient way of storing your values. You can imagine that this data frame, there are a lot of zeros, right? And just having all of these zeros is not an efficient way to store information because what's the point of storing all these zeros? Might as well just store 
where there are non-zeros. So this is what a sparse matrix is. You can see here, I mean, this is not a really good representation of it, but basically a sparse matrix stores the row index, column index, and the value. So instead of storing this entire thing, it's gonna do like, all right, uh, row zero, column acting has the value two. Uh, row one, able one. One, actress one. So it's just a more efficient way of storing information. However, one downside is we have to turn it into a dense matrix, which is this, which will allow us to put into a data frame. So before doing the too dense, this is what it looked like. So just in case any of you run into this issue, that's what's going on. Any questions about this? Cool. All right then. So moving on, this function does the count vectorizing. Uh, you can see that if I run this on all of my reviews, I end up with this straight away. Um, in your projects, if you're doing NLP, really good idea to just create functions so that you don't have a lot of repetitive code. Um, this function does the exact same thing, but just with TFIDF. So again, remember that they are alternatives. Um, so here you can see again, all of these decimal values. Um, so any questions before we move on to like a classification problem? All right, so let's do a really quick classification problem. Um, the data set that we're gonna use is um, a satire versus not satire problem. Hold on, I always forget to put this in. I think it's in resources, oops, resources, there we go. So let's take a look at our shape. We have a thousand rows, two columns. We'll take a look at why. The target is balanced, and this is what our data looks like. These are all news articles. I believe some of it is taken from The Onion. I believe the satire ones are taken from The Onion, the non-satire from some real news source. Uh, but you can see that here we have um, satire and non-satire. And this is just an example of one of the texts. Uh, they seem to be all politically, they're all in the realm of politics. I believe this is a couple of years ago. Um, so this one is just talking about resignation of James Madison, Secretary of Defense, so and so forth. So we're just gonna go through the very, very quick process of, or very quickly, the process of doing text classification. So first you gotta split up your text data and your target because you don't want your target to get messed up in all of that pre-processing. Next, we can get our, um, String punctuation, I, this is actually pretty cool. I'll show you all what this is. And RE is regex. So string punctuation, again, it just gives you all of the punctuation and this is helpful for your cleaning later on. So here you can see we're setting our stop words. Um, again, like I mentioned before, you can add your own stop words to this list. So stop words, stop words, English. Let me actually just output this before we move on. Stop words words is literally a list of stop words that NLTK has deemed as stop words. So it's pretty comprehensive, much easier than hard coding all of this on your own, but you can definitely add to them. So here I'm adding all of the punctuation and all of these other punctuations. So I guess a lot of these texts come from satirewire.com. So I just wanna clean that as well. Um, so I'm gonna add that to my stop words list. So Basically, I have my original stop words list, adding punctuation, adding, of, adding, adding all of these as well. And let's take a look at our final list. So our final stop words list, see, has all of these punctuations, all of these we saw before. Uh, let's see if there's satire, see, satire wire is here as well. So in our cleaning steps, it will consider all of these other things as well to be cleaned. So here we have a quick function that removes stop words. So per article, we're just gonna remove anything that isn't in, uh, we're only gonna keep the things that are not in the stop word set. So just really quickly, this one takes a little bit of time, but now you can see this is the first article. The first article looks like this. Of course, not perfect. There are some numbers. I mean, whether you wanna keep numbers or not, that's something that's actually pretty easy to, to edit. You can add numbers into your stop words. Um, this, instead of this tokenizer, you can also pass it through the regex tokenizer, which will help you get rid of numbers if you don't want numbers as well. Um, so yeah, so this is now our cleaned text. 
So now that we have our clean text, uh, we're going to create a total vocab list. So what that means is we're going to take a look at all of our words. So for comment and process data, we're just going to have this comment. So our total vocab, this is just going to be a list of all the unique words, oops, all the unique words that we have in all of our words. So you can, all of our documents, sorry. You can see that we have all of these. This would be useful for EDA. Uh, so if you're doing your EDA, plotting your word counts, so on and so forth, that's what this would be used for. Um, really quickly, we're gonna do a list of lists so that we can see the lemmatized outputs. So sorry, a list of strings so that each of our texts will be reduced to something like this. No capital letters. Um, yeah, no capital letters, no stop words, all in a single list. Um, and then let's see what we have here. We have our lemmatized output and also our target. Um, so this should all look kind of familiar just with some of our new NLP components. We have our chain test split and this lem just stands for lemmatized. Um, this is here just in case you're using different, um, different data sets, sorry, different text processing techniques. It's always good to add to your uh, variable names. So as an example, we're just gonna use the TFID vectorizer. And so if you remember to prevent data leakage, we are going to do a fit transform on the train set and just a transform on the test set. And then as you remember, it's in a sparse matrix. Um, so let's just quickly look at this. This is also part of EDA. The, num the average number of non-zero elements in vectorized articles. So basically the average word count in um, the average word count per article is 163. And the percentage of columns that contain a zero is about 99%. Um, when we get closer to the project, I'll talk about some cleaning techniques that will help reduce this. Because um, we're a little bit low on time, I'm going to speed through this EDA, but it should be pretty self-explanatory. We're going to split up our texts into our satire and non-satire. Um, so here we're having the text and we're going to process all of the text and we're going to print some, uh, some visualizations. So this basically leads up to the visualizations. And we have our frequency distributions. All right, so with our frequencies, you can see that in the satire text, I mean, this is done in this format, but you can of course pl plot it in a bar graph. Uh, you can see in satire text, they talk about people, EU, would, may, like, even, apparently also Brexit Britain, so this maybe happened in like 2016. Um, and then with non-satire words, you have the US, Trump, government, president. So this seems more US centric, this more Europe centric, I don't know for now, but we'll see. Um, next, we can also look at the normalized word frequency, which is literally the same thing, just like a normalized out of like a percentage of all the words used. And as visualizations, we can do this too. So really quickly, we can see bar graphs comparing the satire, non-satire words, these are the frequencies. Um, as EDA for NLP project, this is very, very common. This is the standard EDA. Um, next with word clouds. I'm sure you all have seen word clouds before. I will say word clouds are not sufficient in as EDA because they are not quantifiable. They're not quantitative. So word clouds are great for presentation because there are presentation fees. So, um, if you want your presentations, feel free to have word clouds, but here's the code for word clouds. Basically, this is the satire text. This is the non-satire text. The bigger the word, the more common. All right, so finally, we have our classification. I'm gonna throw in a random forest model. I will say, yes, naive base tends to be the best for text predictions, but random forests are great because we can actually grab the feature importances, which is sometimes, uh, which is, a good thing to use for like making recommendations or learning about your model. So let's just quickly do this random forest classifier. Hopefully this won't take too long. Okay, great. And let's take a look at our results. 
So with our results, we have a testing accuracy of 0.97, F1 score 0.969, that's actually really good. Um, we can see our confusion matrix. Only six things were misclassified, that's good. And from our feature importances, of course, you can join this with our column names. So I believe it is, let me do a quick list zip of our column name. It is Y, I think it's X train lem, I hope. columns. Hope this is right off the top of my head. All right. List object. All right, never mind. Basically, you know that you can find out basically which are the most important words in classifying your text satire and non-satire. Um, but yeah, sorry I had to rush through this. Um, feel free to ask me questions, but I really wanted to talk about the next steps of what we're going to talk about on Monday. Conclusions really quickly, foundations of NLP. I know there's a lot of, it basically allows us to represent our language in a way that computers understand. So these are by means of count vectorizing and TFID vectorizing, both of which are bag of words methods. We can use the machine learning algorithms that we already learned to classify text documents. Here I use random forest, you can use naive Bayes, really any of the classification things. Um, honestly, you can also throw this data into a regression model. Uh, but because of all of the assumptions, regression models won't work super well. However, there are still disadvantages to representing language this way. We'll talk about more things on Monday. Um, and some of the things we'll talk about Monday are word embeddings is a really big one. Word embeddings is kind of a result of neural networks. So we'll skirt around the neural networks for now and talk about how we can use word embeddings on Monday, as well as topic modeling, which is kind of like a clustering method for words. Um, but yeah. Sorry, I had to rest through all of this. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know right on top, uh, you used for stop words, like uh, uh, all the times you used uh, English. Mm -hmm. That's right. So is it because of like all this uh, is based on English language? Or? Yes, it is based on English language. I'm. Yeah, for example, I think you can see like there are Spanish stop words. I don't know if it's Spanish or as yeah. So there are Spanish stop words as well. I mean, if I have seen projects done in other languages, mainly because like pe these people's first language was another language and they actually, based on their, um, on what they were presenting, they said that it worked well. So I've seen it done in German and I've seen it done in, I think, I forget Spanish or Italian, I forget, but one of those. As long as they use the same uh, alphabets, style, right? Same way the alphabets are used, mm -hmm. like A to Z, this should be fine, right? Yeah, I'm actually, I wouldn't be surprised if NLTK has other stop words. Oops, NLTK stop words. Let's see, NLTK. I wouldn't be surprised if they have like non, oh, not this one. I wouldn't be surprised if they have other languages. So here, let's just see what they have. Um, okay, fine. I guess there's no like quick way to do it, but here, yeah. Yeah, I guess these do look like all like letter, letter words. Uh, Arabic? No, I don't know. Oh, right. Yeah, Arabic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've seen, um, it's not a student of mine, but I've seen on like towards data science, like a project that was an NLP project in Farsi, which I believe is what they speak in Iran. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not too sure. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. And these are all like I believe these, I mean, these are like hard coded out. So yeah, really interesting. Well, um, I will say NLP is a very, very vast field. I will say it's also one of the quicker growing fields currently. Um, so a lot of new things are happening. The stuff that I'm gonna talk about tomorrow, oh, sorry, I keep saying tomorrow, but on Monday, these are things that have only come into play like in the last like 
two, three years. They've really only gained like popularity in the past two, three years. So excited to talk about that. They are appendix materials, so not necessary to incorporate in your projects. Uh, but yeah, I will say NLP, it's important to practice uh, just because all of these pre-processing steps and getting used to what needs to be done you, you can already see that, you know, some functions happen on a word level, some happen on like a, a paragraph level, and it's all about getting used to it. I personally run into errors all the time when I'm doing my own NLP projects, um, and it really helps to just have functions written out so I don't have to remember um, what works on what. Um, but yeah, any final questions before we close out for the day? All right. Awesome. Um, I will say the NLP labs on Learn are good ones to work through, especially if you have an interest in NLP. Um, they really break things down. This is the entire section condensed into an hour. So they really do break things down in those sessions. So I highly recommend those if you want to, you know, get into the weeds of NLP. All right. Well, uh, if there's nothing else, have a good rest of your night, everybody. And I will talk to you on Monday. Good night. All right. Thank you. Yash. Bye, everyone.